Welcome to this fireside chat with me, Dave Chapman, uh, from CloudReach, and Jonathan Allen from AWS. Hey, John, how are you doing, man? Hey, Dave, good to see you, mate. Are you keeping well and keeping safe? Uh, yes, keeping safe. Obviously, like all of us, uh, still at home at the moment, and probably for uh, a little while into the future as well. Yeah, exactly so. Exactly so. I need to get your head in the right place, don't you? So do you want to, um, you really do you want to introduce yourself and your background a little, John? Sure. So um, I'm a, a director at Amazon Web Services, working in the enterprise strategy team. Uh, been with AWS three years. Um, what does an enterprise strategist do? Um, well, very similar role to you, Dave, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. I spend my life helping customers around the world, uh, mainly working with the executive committees to help them understand uh, and survive, really, uh, the changing customer expectations um, in the world at the moment and under see, uh, helping them understand and capitalize on how cloud can make a huge difference in that regard. Uh, before joining AWS, I spent 17 years working at Capital One, um, uh, uh, final roles as a divisional CTO, uh, helping Capital One on their journey to, to leverage cloud. Um, and it's good to be here today, Dave. Welcome, man. Uh, and as John alluded to, we've actually got very similar backgrounds. Um, I do a very similar job at CloudReach to the job that John does at AWS. So I work with with customers to help them understand the power of the cloud uh, and the challenges of getting from where they are now to the cloud and all the attendant transformation that's required. And before that, also got 20 years in enterprise IT. So um, my last main role was at BP, helping BP with its cloud transformation. I did that for seven years and actually john you and i worked together for, for a little while there didn't we you came in and helped us we did help. i remember that it was like two and a half years ago now i think uh mm -hmm. i came in and we worked together on a migration readiness assessment um so yeah That's it was right. great to work with you dave yeah it was good stuff it was good stuff and and here we are in uh in a world that was different anyway and now of course given the the current situation that we find ourselves in uh, very different so what, what john and very i different. thought we'd do is we'll just spend half an hour or so just talking about what being a leader in a crisis situation and a chaotic situation is and share some of our experiences, both past and present, and what can help with that sort of situation. So let, let's start with John. What's your view of what not business as usual looks like? How do you think it how do you think it impacts your your the leadership that you need to show as an IT leader or a cloud leader uh, at this time? Yeah, well as you know, Dave, when you're running operations of any kind in any business, um, you you always have a plan for crises that are going to occur. And certainly in my own career, uh, I've been in that situation two or three times. Um, uh, normally, obviously, when there's been uh, critical technology uh, issues of one of one way or another, and they are always singularly the most um, focused and and stressful. Uh, professional yeah. experience of your life bluntly hmm. uh, you know there is no business as usual um, your, your calendar is instantly cleared it's your job as a leader to to step up 24 7 um, which is very difficult uh, and lead uh, the team through it yeah and from my situation when I've been in those events um, there's a number of things that happen one of the one of the human things that happens is actually the bond you develop in stressful situations like that with your team. Mm. Uh, and when I mean team, I mean everybody, both uh, up and down and across the organization, because there's this real uh, togetherness that this is a shared problem and we're in it together. And yeah. that actually brings together almost an acuteness um, of decision-making, of crushing honesty when you don't know something. Yeah. Um, and suddenly some of the things that were previously priorities are no longer priorities in any way shape or form so mm. it's, it's in a very yeah. acute moment of time um uh, that you go through um what's your experiences dave uh, so similar in a lot of ways I, I i completely concur with the it it brushes everything that was a that was a concern before out of the way 
So where you had political differences or where you had different differences in, of approach, it becomes ultra outcome centric very quickly. And I think that for, for all of the, the, the stressful, painful aspect of what's going on, and sometimes that can be emotionally difficult as well as kind of taxing from a professional perspective, um, what, what is very good is the, the pace you can achieve during that during those periods of time is is second to none partly because it has to be and partly because mm. the things you normally spend your time doing when you're trying to make some aspect of change in an organization um, all of that moves out of the way um, the other thing i think that that often happens depending on the the nature and size of the of the crisis in hand and i think we're clearly seeing this in the world at the moment is that is that reprioritization reprioritization can happen all the way across the organization so to, to use a different example from what's going on with us right now like it was visible in some of the major cyber attacks that happened a couple of years ago remember the big ransomware attacks that were going on in various different organizations where huge percentages of their of their of their front end and actually their server estates were impacted by ransomware which was an extinction level event for those companies potentially uh, and there was, I, I won't name any names but there was a, there was a couple in particular that were that were hugely impacted by this and i actually had a friend of mine that was that was running the response the the it response in one of those companies and he talks about it like this it was like it was 6 months of of ultra focused effort just to try and get the organization to keep moving during those times Yeah, it, it, it's amazing how things change and how how much time you actually spend as a leader on consensus management outside of a crisis. That's the, that's most certainly true. I mean, there's a there's a piece of work. So I I um I I normally do as part of my day job a, a podcast called Cloud Busting, and we talk about a thing on Cloud Busting, uh, which is a Harvard Business Review article called A Leader's Framework for Decision Making, and in that there is a a really helpful two by two grid that's called the Kneffin framework, which is Welsh for home, I think. And in the Kneffin framework, it describes the world in sort of in you know in a in a four box grid. Um, the bottom right of that would be the world of order, which is repeatable processes, very understood, very optimized. The top right, which is which is not an indication necessarily of good, it's just another square in this particular model is the world of complicated and the world of complicated has got it's got reduced unknowns so it might be a very difficult thing that's being done like the building of a building is a very complicated thing but we've done it lots of times as human beings so we so even though there's some unknowns like well, what's the ground going to be like we've got coping strategies for every aspect of what's about to what's about to come up but then on the other side of the grid so the top left and bottom left is the world of chaos and the world of chaos has also got two states it's got a state of complexity where um, the level of unknown unknowns is very very high um, but um, within a week two weeks say two sprints or four sprints you can begin to see patterns and those patterns can then can then begin to start to um, impact uh, your decision making and that can happen quite quickly so you're constantly pattern spotting However, in the world of chaos, the world of chaos is like sub-second decision making where no, there, there is no patterns, everything is an unknown, and you just mm. have to make decisions to move things forward. Sometimes where you don't think or don't even know whether that decision is right, but actually the step forward is more important than rightness. Does any of that resonate with you, John, in terms of how you would apply it to crisis management situations? Yeah, I mean, particularly the, you, the, you've got to take an action, right? Because no action actually isn't an option unless you truly are waiting for a result of something from one of your previous actions. Hmm. Um, I think there's, you know, it, it's interesting because when you are in time of crisis and I've had suddenly all of the resources of the organization are available at my disposal, you know, as a divisional leader to, you know, get to or or, or to ensure the safety of my employees and the safety of my customers is it becomes my primary priority um i think what it what it sort of focused to me um was 
it's, 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 you know, although we've got to be very careful uh, of bringing things like Agile into this conversation, you know, at its heart uh, of Agile is I've got dedicated resources working towards an outcome. Yeah. And yeah. suddenly when you're in crisis mode, you've got all the resources you need. Many times, you know, when I was speaking to my fellow leaders, the conversation would go, I can give you anything you need, Jonathan. And it would be like, great. And suddenly you can cut across and grab resources and they're a hundred percent available to you. And it's interesting, you know, when you look at the old way of doing business for 20, 30, 40 years with technology, when we've worked with waterfall, um, and you know what, you know, when you look at technology, it's such, such a young industry that we've been borrowing other people's concepts like architect and engineer from uh, from industries that have been established for decades yeah. and trying to put this um, the fallacy of linear planning in place of waterfall <laughs> of look going from A to B yeah. is a straight line. And, it, and it's not it's not yeah. a straight line. Uh, and, you know, certainly when you're in a crisis mode, um, it's definitely not a, a straight line in any way, shape or form. You are yeah. literally, in many ways, you, you want to get to a situation that is is normal. Um, and, and you're trying to just take information from all the points uh, and get to to that better normal place. And you're taking one step after another to get there. But it's actually, you know, when you look at it, it's it's almost agile and it's purest, single minded, focused goal. And yet when the crisis is over, we somehow go back to our, some, some predetermined patterns. Um, and this, so there is some really interesting learnings, fascinating learnings that can come out of crisis management um, as you go through that. And, and I love your analogy of chaos versus non chaos and, and particularly how many unknowns are there. Mm. Um, as you're going through that it's, just, it, it's fascinating to me and it, it can be it, you know as I said before it can be an incredibly bonding moment you know it cuts through um, any type of, of you know cloaks we may put over ourselves and our personalities when we're at work it just cuts straight through them yeah. uh, and suddenly it's very raw M emotions are very raw people are very worried people are in sometimes very scared mm. uh, of what's happening to them uh, and, and, and normally an organization they adore working for so lots yeah. and lots of emotions coming through um and you're as a leader you're trying to stay calm and, and lead through and it, it's it's very mentally stressful it's very mentally stressful you've got to have you've got to have some control mechanisms some some outlet mechanisms in that i found Yes, no, I, I I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. The 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 emotional burden as well as the physical burden of often 15, 16 hour days can 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 be very heavy. And I think that the leader should be aware of the fact that they're under that level of stress. You know, be intentional about how you look after yourself because if you go down, that gets even more dis, you know um, disarming and 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 worrying for the people that are trying to get things done. Yeah, I mean, just just you know what what I used to find, and and this is as I got more tenured at dealing with you know critical incidents and crises, was you, you actually have got to prepare for twenty four seven working, hmm. um, and you can't do seventy two hours awake. It's not humanly possible. And actually, you know, one of the first things I used to do if we ever went into a crisis was send people home. It's like right, I I need you to come in tonight, so I'd like you to now go home. Right. Uh, I'll take 50% of the resources and this 50% needs to go home and get some rest and because I'm going to need you to work through the evening and these are these are incredibly difficult conversations you know you have to do and in some in I remember one situation I had many years ago now um, I, I actually had to cancel people's holidays oh yeah it's rough yeah. and that that's an incredibly emotional you know thing to take through um when people have planned their lives around these once you know the, these events I, um, I, had a, I, had a, I had a personal experience with that actually i was um quite early on in my career i was doing um sort of server and infrastructure hands-on operations in the days where you literally used to take servers apart and lay them on the floor of a data center. And the data center was in the office that I was working in. And it was Arthur Anderson's headquarters in London. And I was working there at the time the Enron crisis happened. Right. And one of the things that happened there was the day that Anderson in the US was indicted, um, the, 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 the continuity response to that was all of the tops of the directories had to get rebuilt. You know, the, the active directory and the NDS good old NDS because a lot Novell of that, NDS. I used to love NDS 
um, and it top, all of that stuff topped out. So all the roots were were all in Sarasota, and there was a risk that 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 all the, all the offices would get locked down. So we had to rebuild all the roots of the directories, which is always a hairy process anyway. Yeah. In in the London data center, and that was when I was due to be going skiing, and that that had to uh, you know that had to be abandoned, and that was That's that tough. was a crazy few weeks. Yeah, th these are stressful situations, but you know there are there are after the events over, you know you take away the learnings, um, you know, and, and kind of look at actually what what went well, yeah. what what did we learn, and some of the previous. Um, mental blockers are on a different way of doing things you mm. you just realize it is no longer true at all um and certainly from my own journey um when we talk about you know benefits with customers and we talk about pros and cons um and going to cloud people actually don't know what they don't know um before they well, go to cloud indeed and, and I, I i do want to pick up on a point that you you touched on there which is it seems to me that the, the crisis the, the crisis that are big enough and by that i'm talking about what's kind of going on now in 2020 i'd be talking about things like um you know bp's crisis i'd be talking about things like those cyber attacks that we that we touched on a little bit earlier those are crises that are major events for organizations that impact everything versus say Ones that are stressful, but less so, like a data center going off or, a, yep. or an ERP going off. Those are horrible. That's a horrible week. But at the end of it, you know, everyone does a lessons learned. We fix a bunch of things that weren't right before. It doesn't really paradigm shift. I think where I'm going here is like crisis level when it's fully paradigm shift, that it that it effectively reframes the decision making that follows. And it seems to me that there is a there is a potential pattern. And this would, wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on it, where you have the initial crisis moment, and that crisis moment is one of ultra reaction, almost panic, not really knowing what's coming next and not being able to see past the end of that panic period. During that period, what normally happens is if it's big enough, all investment gets canned. Everybody everybody pauses everything, basically because they're waiting to see what the outcome of this thing is, that it's it's so significant. Then there's a settling period where Everyone almost comes out of the bunker and has a look around and goes, is, is it, it, you know, what are, what are we dealing with here? So it's a thoughtful mm. period that then emerges during which, again, things would still be paused because people are trying to get to grips with the situation and work out what the hell is going on and what the response needs to be. And then you start new paradigm response, which is reframed investment. And what do we now need to do differently? as an organization uh, what do you what are your thoughts on that does that resonate i, I think it absolutely resonates and um you know these these i, I call them catalytic events mm. um you know can drive and educate people on, on you know what's going on in the world and, and we mustn't you know detract from from um the the awfulness that is going on at the moment in the world and many yeah. people are, are desperately worried uh about themselves their family and their jobs but at the same time you know as you said when you come when you start you learn from all of this and when you come out it's like well is there a better way yeah. and um certainly from my own journey um and, and the conversations I have with executive committees, you know, executive committees are, are looking for growth. Of course, they're looking for growth. Mm. They're looking to be well managed. They're, they're dealing with mergers, acquisitions and divestitures of, of different business units. Um, they're looking to make sure that the business is, is profitable yeah. uh, in, in many cases, unless they're a non for, uh, not for profit. Um, that's what the executive committees are looking are looking to do. But also what we see and, and the conversation I have with chief executive officers is a recognition that you know a different execution model is required to survive customer expectations at, at the moment around the world, and what can be done um, to move forward and do things differently. Um, you know, one customer, for example, uh, Netflix. You know, you go back in their in their history, uh, and actually one of their big pivot points um, to use cloud 
was from a three-day um, database outage they suffered on premise, oh, uh, which, which was which was a huge, you know, a, a catalytic event for them. Very very different from what the world's dealing with at the moment, mm. but a real emotive topic to go. Hold on, our business just stopped. We didn't ship any DVDs because obviously back then the Netflix primary business go to market model was shipping DVDs. Yeah, uh, they couldn't ship any. Um, which for them was uh, almost, you know, a business, well, it was a business stop event and it kind of refocused their mind on what are we doing? Where are we going? They learned a lot from it. It's a pivot point. Uh, and, and actually when you look back into the history of time, you know, um, Amazon, uh, com had some similar learnings from that. So if you mm -hmm. look back, you know, Werner Vogel's, um, at reinvent last year, shared a really interesting story how some of the Oracle rack databases they were using uh, had, had, had a scalability problem, you know, and they stopped working. And right. that actually caused Amazon to go, hold on, you know, this, this is this is not good at all. What is, we've got to think differently. We've got to ask, you know, five whys, you know, if you're familiar with it, there's, yeah. you've got to ask five whys to truly get to that root cause and realize that you know data has a lot of gravity and and actually how they're going to respond and scale and grow to meet these customer expectations was actually a catalytic event and one of the catalytic events that led to you know amazon web services being uh, created in in 2006 well it, well it's interesting you raise those points because we we have because i've been wondering about something similar and what the what the world might look like when we do get to the other side of what's happening right now is what you know what what accelerated adoption is going to look like um there, there is a you know we're, we're talking here now at the on the first of april and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff being written already about what accelerated digital adoption is going to look like in a world where digital infrastructure has suddenly become very very critical to people and their and their lives previously it was it was an important part of life um, but now i think we, we recognize how critical it is when we can't just go out to the shop and i think there is a there is a, a rising tide of people writing on you know is that here to stay so is that is the nature of now digital being almost national critical infrastructure level importance is that is that here to stay so that, that's an interesting thought, I think. And in CloudReach, we um, we talk about cloud eras of adoption, and we track it about across the ten years or so of CloudReach's history. <clears throat> and we see era one, which was which we st th this this isn't strictly linear, so it kind of runs offset parallel. Era one is IT led adoption, where predominantly some bright sparks in IT. I was definitely one of those, who well, I wouldn't say bright spark, a spark in IT, that um, that got interested in cloud, could see its advantages for an organization and spent seven years of my life, you know, persuading an organization to do that and, and VP are doing an absolutely astonishingly good job at that at the moment. So that was IT led adoption which is we're doing it to close the data center we're going to save some money and by the way there's probably some upside somewhere then there's era two which is offset era one which i call business experimentation which is in those organizations where um like marketing are doing something or hr are doing something in the cloud they may be using some SaaS, or they may be using some PaaS, or they may have built their own cloudified application because someone had an idea that they now want to go b2c instead of b2b the cloud gives them some opportunity to be able to scale to that to that size very quickly. Sometimes that doesn't even involve IT. So you get these like islands, and then those islands get endorsed and become like chief digital offices. So mm -hmm. you have this then pattern across big organizations where you've got IT-led adoption doing some sort of big heavy lifting, trying to close data centers, but actually probably not made a particularly strong business-centric revenue case. And then you've got these islands of adoption that are dotting up around the organization where they're truly trying to innovate business with the cloud. And then we were we were sort of ball, you know, uh, crystal ball gazing a little bit and saying era three is probably big pivot. So it's the era where either that stuff gets joined up in an organization and they decide, actually, we've got enough now to recognize 
at enterprise level, what a new model might look like. And the example I'm, I use, which is what triggered this thought, John, is I use Netflix as that. You know, that's a, that's a point where they had an event which triggered such a massive pivot for them as a business that they're almost unrecognizable for the, from the Netflix that you described that had that event. I wonder whether what's happening now is going to accelerate era three. What do you think? I think... Um... I think it. I think it could, Dave. Is the, is the answer, and I and I think very similar to you. When I have this conversation and talk about it in in keynotes, um, history can inform the future here. So you, you know, people say we're in the digital age. Um, tremendous disagreements and agreement on what that means to different people. But if you know, um, if you look at some of the quotes from history, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Um, you know, assumed to be said by George Satanaya. Um, when you look at the Industrial Revolution, like let's just take a, a, a really short back at Industrial Revolution, right? So the Industrial Revolution started having these factories for the first time, powered by water wheels. All the machines in the in the factory were powered by belts and pulleys from this one central column. Then along came the steam engine. And what did we do? We just swapped out the water wheel for the steam engine. Gave us a little bit of power, but we still had um, you know, the belts and pulleys. And then what happened next? The electric engine came along. So we did the same. We swapped out the steam engine for the electric engine, but still belts and pulleys. And it wasn't actually until the next generation came along and we said, hold on, what are we doing with belts and pulleys still? Why mm. have we still got belts and pulleys? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, hold on. We've actually we can change this now. We can have these little electric engines everywhere, and then suddenly you start going all the way to you know what um, Henry Ford did when he put the mass production line in place, and suddenly we've got these little electric engines everywhere. And now when you look at uh, the size of an electrical actuator and a motor, well these things are tiny, and we've embedded them everywhere. So it it, it almost takes time for people to see the art of the possible. But as we know, these S curves of adoption have accelerated massively. You know, yeah. it used to be it took decades for refrigerators to come into our households. It used to take a decade for VHS to come into our household. Yet from 2007, from when the iPhone launched, when cloud launched in 2006, when APIs came to fruition, these um, global uh, or general purpose technologies, these GPTs, mm. have opened up a, an entirely different way of doing business. Yeah. Um, you know, yes, and one, I, sorry, go on. one crystal example I've got is, you know, why why has Waterfall been so predominant for so long in the information technology era? And and you can't, and you look at it and you step, take a step back, and I'm like, well, I used to have 22 teams working for me in infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. And the, and they they looked after the data center. They knew um all the different teams from from a windows team to a unix team to a, a middleware team to a storage team and those teams were good at that technology mm. and that's how you needed to be when you run on-premise data centers you need that yeah. um and suddenly when all of that is consumed or can be can be uh substantiated through an api well now things become a little different but it takes time for you to understand the art of the possible um, it, you know, it to sort does. of build on on that metaphor you started. It does, and and yeah, I, I like that sort of uh, growing ahead of steam around it. And I, I I've all, I'd always thought that the era three transformations would be would end up being like like fundamentally business driven. So all of those experiments around the edges that I was describing in the model earlier would ultimately join up in a way that gave one or a number of people some insight or a penny drop moment that they hadn't seen before or maybe they were leveraging some ml or data that was coming off the back of all of that um what i think is happening at the moment then that that i think will almost supersede that will be it will be some continuity led transformation where actually business continuity is, is going to become such a profound transformational driver that actually it might overtake the need to join up those experiments it, it, it could do. And, you know, who knows what the impact of, you know, uh, I mean, I think I read yesterday that 3.4 billion people on the planet are now, you know, in, in effect at home uh, and trying to yeah. work from home. 
that's that this is unprecedented in, in human history and what behaviors are going to come off of that in, in right. new ways of working you know do we do we need to travel to an office every day uh, i mean i've actually worked from home for a long time or i have still traveled you know to meet customers probably exactly like yourself um what is this going to change because you know accelerated you know socioeconomic change like this is, is actually doesn't happen very often in human history at all no, technology normally leaps ahead of social change uh, which normally takes many decades to to be impacted um so i think we don't know and i think you know people are going to be looking at this for a long time but i think it is going to be in some situations a catalyst to people learning for sure learning about what they can do in these situations because suddenly they've had to ask what is the art of the possible so to, so to, to bring our conversation to a bit of a close let's let's come down to where we are potentially practically at this point and and maybe give some thoughts on what you would do if you were if you were tasked with dealing with some something like this in an organization so we've spent a, bu a bunch of time thinking about this at CloudReach and trying to think our way through how would you accelerate VDI? How would you accelerate aspects of cloud transformation or, or even just moves to the cloud, predominantly driven by you know, the challenges that are probably inherent in running physical premises right now? So where, where previously physical premises were, were potentially a debatable thing, this, this whole new aspect of you might not even be able to get to them. It might not be safe to get humans into them. You might have hardware supply chain that's disrupted. There could be a number of different things going on. Yeah. What What do you think? What, what distinctions would you draw between managing that maybe in a in a cloud way and managing that in a in a traditional way? Well, I'm you know drawing on my own experience like you do when I was a you know in an enterprise and leading teams. Obviously, my first thought is is safety of my um, employees, yeah. followed by safety of my customers. Um, and then I'm looking at all of the risks to that. You know, it's all, always coming back to the people. And, you know, when it comes to the art of the possible, you know, as I, I was just talking about, I am looking at, well, can this just in time manufacture a supply chain spare part I need? Is it still there? Hmm. Because, you know, data centers do require continual care, love, and attention. Uh, yeah. Things break <laughs> all the time. They're they're, uh, they're delicate little flowers a lot of the time. Yeah, things break things break all the time. So I am looking at now that I'm looking at the new stresses and strains on my systems. If I'm running contact centers, I'm really now looking at well, can I have uh, people work from home? Does my technology support that? Is there a secure location from that person to work from home? I actually had to renew my car insurance the other day. Uh, and the person I got to was at home. It was it was really interesting because instead of a noisy contact center in the background, it was clear somebody was in a totally silent environment. Mm. And I actually said, you're, you're not a, you're not in the office, are you? She went, no, I'm at home and I'm, I'm fortunate. And this was the word she, she, how she said, I'm fortunate to have a home office, which is a, a secure environment to be able to have this conversation. Yeah, right. Um, and she's actually, for the first time ever, working from home, taking customer calls. So, you know, the, these are barriers which have just instantly had to come down uh, to enable this so you know if you do look at you know how we're trying to support our customers uh, with Amazon Connect obviously uh, our mm -hmm. contact center service um, with workspace Amazon workspace is obviously uh, the virtual desktop infrastructure we have and, and Amazon Chime you know our, our collaboration service you know really you know making obviously it's always been available but really helping customers if they've not used that for the first time understand how to do that um, what's available. Um, Amazon has introduced some new workspace pricing uh, on April the 1st. And really just, again, you know, helping people understand the art of the possible. So as they're looking of, well, how do I run my contact center differently? How do I enable my workforce to work from home? Um, that those technologies are available to them. And as you said a minute ago, the um, the digital landscape has, you know, fortunately changed dramatically I read an interesting article yesterday that said, well, what if this had happened in, you know, 2002? Yeah, right. Where, right. You, know, you know, what would the world be? You know, and, and back then we were still dealing with, you know, dial-up modems at 56K. You know, these were... Well, I think you would, these... you would immediately have to see, like, different level governmental responses, right? Because actually the, the, the infrastructural supply chains that are in place because of large digital companies 
like your good selves are, are critical infrastructure at this point. Now, if that wasn't there and kind of home delivery shopping wasn't there, like you know, for food and for food and um, water, we would have a very different governmental response on our hands, I think, because they would have to have set up those supply chains. Yeah, and that includes home delivery, right? As part of that, exactly, that yeah. supply chain. Um, and, and you know, it's it's tough to get a delivery slot at the moment. Um, it it's quite is. rightly, you know, people, you know, people are, you know, in an ideal world, you know, uh, hoping that their their shopping can come to them. So, in many ways, we are we are benefiting as, a, a, you know, with these new tools available. But you know, bringing it back. Um, these times, you know, are you know are unprecedented, and, and people have, have, have rightly got to just ensure the safety of themselves, their families, their employees, and their customers, and put that front of mind. And everything else kind of takes a, a back seat at the moment. I think that's a great note to end on, John. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to see you, man. Take care. Be safe.